Chapter 61 Treat you to a meal you are listening at NovelFull.audio Translator Atlas Studios Editor Atlas Studios When a member of the family came in to report the good news, Dominic was so excited that his fingers began trembling. He asked profusely, Really? Are you not lying to me? The family member nodded agitatedly. Yes. The Brilliance Corporation has really decided to cooperate with us, and they have already sent someone over to sign the contract with us. Our factories are also back in operation. And the bank has decided to give us some leeway for the loan repayment because the Brilliance Corporation has decided to be our guarantor. They're no longer going to apply for compulsory execution. Good. Dominic was so excited that he rubbed his hands together. The Carter's crisis would be resolved. At this moment, another family member hurried in. Good news, Mr. Carter Sr. The companies that previously terminated their partnerships with us have called to resume their cooperation with us. Great. Wonderful. The Carters have finally gotten through this ordeal. Dominic's face reddened in excitement. All the Carters were overjoyed after surviving this calamity. God knows how hard it had been for them the past two days. They almost wanted to leave the family and find their own way out. Bryce deserves credit for this matter. A woman's voice suddenly sounded. It was Bryce Carter's mother, Sarah Hadley. At the mention of Bryce, Dominic's face immediately turned gloomy again. Don't mention that sinful bastard in front of me. That impudent bastard acted presumptuously and got embroiled in a scandal that embarrassed us greatly. Sarah began pouting aggrievedly. Dominic, you know very well that someone set Bryce up. If that loser Lucas Gray hadn't spiked Bryce's and Brad Douglas's drinks and even filmed a video of them, they wouldn't have ended up like that. Besides, if Lucas hadn't suddenly gone to create trouble that day, the crisis the Carters faced might have been resolved two days ago. With a few words, Sarah blamed everything on Lucas and reminded Dominic of the horror he experienced when Lucas broke into the Carters' main residence and strangled him. He was now full of fear and hatred toward Lucas. Sarah Hadley looked at Dominic's face and continued, Bryce was chased out of the family, and he's very upset too. Yesterday, he was going around running errands for the Carters. Doesn't he deserve any credit? Also, Bryce is your only grandson after all. It's right for you to be angry with him, and you can teach him a lesson as much as you'd like, but can you really bear to drive him out of the family? Sarah pretended to wipe her tears. Dominic felt conflicted as well. Bryce was his only direct descendant, and he would definitely take over the family in the future. Yesterday, he chased Bryce out of the family only because of a moment of folly, but he mainly wanted to teach Bryce a lesson and did not really want to disown him. Seeing Sarah keep pleading for mercy and several other family members also helping him, Dominic sighed and agreed. Okay, since you're all pleading for him, I'll give him another chance. But if he creates any trouble or disgraces the family again, don't blame me for being ruthless. Yes, definitely. I'll also take Bryce in hand and make sure he listens to you. Sarah agreed frantically with a joyful expression. On the other hand, after hearing Dominic's decision to let him return to the family, Bryce simply felt that that should have been the case anyway. He was Dominic Carter's only biological grandson, and the entire family would be handed over to him in the future, so how could Dominic really drive him out? Lucas is too despicable. He went against me and ruined things for me. He even made me become the laughing stock of the entire county. Bryce swore that he would never let Lucas off easily. While the Carters were immersed in the joy of the family crisis being over, no one knew that it was only because Cheyenne had asked Lucas to give them a way out on account that they used to be family. Otherwise, the Carters would have long fallen apart. However, neither Lucas nor Cheyenne thought of letting the Carters find out the truth. At this moment, Lucas suddenly received a phone call, and the person who called was surprisingly Charlotte. Um. Are you free now? I'd like to treat you to a meal. Charlotte's voice was shaky, and she clearly felt uneasy. 
Lucas burst into laughter. Of course, he knew why Charlotte wanted to treat him to a meal out of the blue. He had saved her that day, but she got the wrong idea and even slapped him. After Cheyenne explained it to her, Charlotte had been feeling very embarrassed and conflicted. She wanted to thank him and apologize to him, but in the end, she was too shy to say anything. She should have mulled over it for a long time before finally calling him. Lucas smiled. He did not intend to hold it against Charlotte. There's no need to treat me to a meal. Before Lucas finished, Charlotte quickly interrupted him, I'll book a private room and be waiting for you at Lion Restaurant. After saying this, she hung up the phone. Lucas was caught between laughter and tears. How can she insist that I let her treat me to a meal? Nevertheless, Lucas arrived at Lion Restaurant at noon. The relationship between him and Cheyenne had finally become less strained, and Charlotte mattered a lot to Cheyenne. So no matter what, Lucas had to give in to Charlotte. Lion Restaurant was a long dot established restaurant in Orange County, and it was famous for being the go.to place for banquets held by businessmen and ordinary patrons. As soon as Lucas got out of his car, he saw Charlotte waiting for him not far away. When she saw him, she finally heaved a sigh of relief, as if she was scared that he wouldn't come. Lucas walked over and touched his nose. Actually, there's really no need to do this. Charlotte glared at him. Since I said that I'd treat you to a meal, I have to honor it. I can still afford to treat you to a meal. Lucas was instantly dumbfounded and speechless. Well, Charlotte was actually not an annoying girl, but she was childish and arrogant. Lucas did not blame her for it. As they were about to enter the restaurant, a voice suddenly sounded from the side. Ha! Huh. Charlotte, it's really you. Gazing at Charlotte, a young man walked over with a gleeful expression. There was a woman with bouncy, curly hair standing close beside him. They were obviously very intimate with each other. Charlotte's expression instantly changed when she saw the man. Afterward, she held on to Lucas's arm somewhat uneasily and smiled radiantly at the couple in front of her. Ah, it's you, Declan. I didn't expect to run into you here. Lucas was caught by surprise when Charlotte suddenly held on to his arm. But afterward, Lucas felt Charlotte turning stiff. It seemed that there was some history between her and this man. Dot. Chapter 62 Coincidental Encounter in the Restaurant You Are Listening at Novel Full. Audio Translator Atlas Studios Editor Atlas Studios Declan Adams was tall and seemed to be around his mid twenties. His features were handsome, and he dressed fashionably. Although he was a man, he put a lot of effort into skin care and he looked just like the young heir of a well dot to dot do family. The long dot-haired woman next to him was about the same age as him. Her face was covered in exquisite makeup, and she was decked out in luxury designer labels such as Gucci, Chanel, Hermes, and others. She was beautiful at first glance, but unfortunately, her face was too plastic. She had obviously had cosmetic surgery on her eyelids and jaw. Declan's gaze lingered on Charlotte's arm for a second, after which he smiled and held on to the shoulder of the woman beside him. He introduced, This is my wife, Estelle Brooke. Estelle snuggled up to Declan and sized Charlotte up. Well. Introduce Charlotte. Sensing Estelle's vague jealousy, Declan hurriedly put his hand on her waist to comfort her. She's Charlotte Carter, my schoolmate from college. Hearing Declan introduce her in this manner, Charlotte couldn't help but bite hard on her lower lip. Ah, so it's Charlotte Carter. I heard Declan mentioning before that there was a schoolmate from college who had been courting him for years, but he never agreed. I didn't expect it to be you. Estelle said these words smilingly and casually pretended to reveal a large diamond ring on her ring finger. Charlotte's smile stiffened. That she did like Declan Adams back in college, but she felt mocked when his wife said it to her face and in such a sarcastic tone. It was worse especially because even Declan seemed conceited. Charlotte was about to say goodbye when she heard Declan say, it's a coincidence today. 
Estelle and I happen to have booked a private room here for a meal. You two should also come along. After all, it's been a long time since we've seen each other. After glancing at Declan, Estelle said, Yeah, the Lion is the most famous and established restaurant in the city. It's noon now, and it'll be hard to get a private room. Let's eat together. Declan and I will be bored if it's just the two of us. Charlotte was about to decline because she had already booked a private room long ago, but Lucas suddenly nodded. Sure then. Charlotte immediately panicked. But since Lucas already spoke and agreed, she could not refute him in front of them. So she could only pinch Lucas's arm secretly. However, Lucas kept a straight face and wasn't bothered by it at all. Soon, a waiter ushered them to a room on the second floor. After they were seated, Declan grabbed the menu and handed it to Estelle. Estelle, see if there's anything you'd like. You can order first. Estelle grabbed the menu smilingly, but she chided Declan, our guests are still here. How can I order first? She glanced at Charlotte and Lucas but remained still, not intending to hand the menu over to them. We're former classmates. What's the point of being so formal with each other? They won't mind, right? Declan held Estelle's waist as he kissed her forehead affectionately. He was directing his last question at Charlotte and Lucas. Back in the day, Charlotte used to bring me my meals for several months when she was courting me. She never missed my breakfast or lunch. Unfortunately, I didn't reciprocate your feelings and shared the food with our classmates. Charlotte, you don't hold it against me, do you? Declan chuckled. Charlotte squeezed her own fingers tightly under the table, almost digging her nails into her flesh. She had once spent a lot of time and effort bringing food for him with her utmost sincerity. Every day, she would get up early just to cook for him, no matter rain or shine. Yet she ended up becoming a laughingstock. Charlotte remained silent. Controlling her emotions was already extremely tough. Seeing the sullen expression on Charlotte's face, Estelle giggled provocatively and coquettishly. However, I really have to thank Miss Carter for being so nice to my husband. I also have to be thankful that Declan didn't give in to your pursuit. Otherwise, we wouldn't have gotten together and be living such a blissful life. Declan held Estelle in his arms gently. It's my honor to be able to marry you. The two of them were showing their affection for each other like nobody's business while Charlotte clenched her jaw and said, I wish you conjugal bliss. Estelle suddenly seemed to realize that there were outsiders around, so she sat up straight shyly. Fortunately, you found your better half too, Miss Carter. Are you married yet? How may I address this man beside you? Charlotte tried to calm herself down before saying calmly, not yet. His name is Lucas Gray. Oh, hello, Mr. Gray. We're both about the same age, so you don't mind me addressing you as Lucas, right? Declan chuckled. Lucas glared at Declan with a mirthless grin. It had been long since anyone talked to him in such a condescending manner. Besides, he was a few years older than Declan, but Declan talked down to him so haughtily. Not at all bothered if Lucas minded it or not. Declan continued to ask in an arrogant tone, Lucas, where do you work now? Lucas smiled. I was a soldier for a few years, but I'm now a freelancer. Hearing this, Declan's and Estelle's eyes were full of disdain. On the other hand, Charlotte glared at Lucas. Why do you have to be so honest? Freelancer. You mean unemployed? Estelle jibed, then covered her mouth while giggling. Lucas, that's not right. As a man, how can you loaf around? You don't want to be sponging off your wife, do you? Ah, uh, I really do. Lucas nodded seriously, as if he found that a great idea. Declan was instantly at a loss for words. He found Lucas handsome and sophisticated at first, but he didn't expect him to be an incompetent wastrel. Charlotte must regret not winning my heart and marrying a handsome and competent man like me. Declan was getting ahead of himself while thinking about it, and he even felt a tremendous sense of superiority. Chapter 63 
Untitled you are listening at novelfull.audio. Translator. Atlas Studios Editor. Atlas Studios having confirmed that Lucas was a good.4. Nothing, Declan could no longer be bothered to continue talking to him. He turned to look at Charlotte and asked, Charlotte, what are you doing now? Charlotte was already sick and tired of Declan's attempts to show his superiority and answered indifferently, I just joined the Stardust Corporation not long ago. Hey, that's such a coincidence. Declan clapped and laughed out loud. I'm in town this time to talk about the cooperation with the Stardust Corporation. I'm old friends with Mr. Davis, the general manager of your company. I'll put in a good word for you in front of him and ask him to look out for you, lest a low-dot-level employee like you have a tough time climbing the corporate ladder. Declan waved his hand and leaned backward proudly, as if he had already gotten Flynn Davis to arrange for Charlotte's promotion. Estelle was a little displeased and glared at Charlotte. Declan may be kind enough to help you, but you have to work hard too. Don't depend entirely on him. Otherwise, it might be difficult for Declan to broach the topic with Mr. Davis even though they're close. Don't you agree? Her tone was derisive, and she made it sound as though Charlotte was pestering Declan to help her get promoted. Charlotte did not have a good temper, and she could tolerate this for such a long time entirely because of her former crush's sake. At this moment, she couldn't tolerate it any longer and sneered. Did I say that I wanted you to help? I will earn my promotion with my own efforts. I don't need you to worry about it. Having been retorted by Charlotte out of the blue, Estelle immediately looked at Declan aggrievedly. Hubby, we were just being kind by offering to help. Why did she say that? With a gloomy expression, Declan patted Estelle's back to comfort her. He said with a frown, Charlotte, I only offered to help you on account that we used to be classmates. Even if you refuse to accept my goodwill, you don't have to be so hostile. Charlotte was almost going to laugh out of anger. At this moment, a waiter knocked on the door of the private room and walked in. Excuse me, everyone. Today, we will be receiving a distinguished guest, so we won't be able to serve you for the time being. I'm extremely sorry. As compensation, all your orders will be on the house today, and we will also gift you a few discount coupons, the waiter spoke courteously and handed over a small goodie bag that had exquisite packaging. Although the waiter apologized, it was obvious that he wanted them to leave immediately. Declan flew into a rage and shouted, you're trying to drive me away. Do you know who I am? Get your manager to come here. Excuse me, sir. This is our manager's intention. Everyone has to leave, no matter who. Please pardon us for the convenience, the waiter said in a respectful tone. However, his attitude was firm. Humph, I just don't believe it. What kind of distinguished guest can make us leave? If you don't tell me clearly, I will smash this restaurant. Declan pointed at the waiter furiously. However, his movements were too large, and he accidentally knocked over a wine glass at the edge of the table, causing it to fall onto the ground with a loud bang. The crisp sound of glass shattering immediately spread. Declan stiffened. He was actually just issuing a verbal threat. A renowned and established restaurant like the Lion was definitely backed by a powerful figure. How could he afford to provoke them? What's going on? A middle-aged man wearing a tag that said, Restaurant Lobby Supervisor pinned on his chest came over with a frown on his face. The waiter hurriedly pointed at Declan. Mr. Jones, you wanted us to clear the rooms, but this gentleman here isn't willing to leave. He wants to know which guest is here, and he accidentally broke the wine glass in the midst of throwing a fit. The manager, Mr. Jones, glanced at Declan and said aloofly, I'm sorry, sir. But Mr. Ethan Sawyer is treating his guests to a meal in our restaurant today. In order to prevent him from being disturbed, everyone else has to leave. I hope to seek your cooperation. Ethan Sawyer Declan was flabbergasted. Ethan Sawyer was the richest man in the county, and he owned businesses in several states. Even those from outside Orange County had heard of him. Compared to Ethan Sawyer, 
Declan Adams was nothing. In fact, if possible, Declan wanted to stay behind, as that might give him the opportunity to have a good talk with the richest man in the county. It would be even better if he could become friends with him. Unfortunately, he probably would have no chance of getting close to Sawyer since he was hosting some guests and wanted the restaurant to be cleared. Declan hurriedly stood up and smiled. I'm so sorry. Had I known earlier that it was Mr. Sawyer, we would have left long ago. I've created such a mess. He put his arm around Estelle's shoulders and said to Charlotte and Lucas, who were still sitting, Charlotte, Lucas, what are you waiting for? Didn't you hear that we have to make way for Mr. Sawyer? Charlotte looked at Declan, whose smile had become humble and deferential. She couldn't help but feel infinite disappointment. Is this the person I carried a torch for, for such a long time back then? Humph, however, Lucas remained in his seat and even sneered in amusement. Are you still not going to get up? We'll be in trouble if we offend Mr. Sawyer. Declan couldn't help but holler angrily when he saw Lucas sitting still in his seat. Is that so? Is Ethan Sawyer kicking up such a big fuss over a meal? Lucas remarked as he held a wine glass playfully. Panic.stricken and furious, Declan said, you actually have the audacity to call Mr. Sawyer by his full name. He's the richest man in the county, and his assets are unimaginable. If you don't respect him, you're going to implicate us, you fool. Estelle said impatiently, why are you wasting your breath on them? Let's hurry and leave. If they end up offending Mr. Sawyer, that'll serve them right. Declan didn't go on any longer and simply glared at Lucas coldly before taking a few more looks at Charlotte's pretty face. Forget it. We have said what we should say. If you don't know any better, don't blame us. Let's go. Holding Estelle's hand, he was just about to leave when a few people coincidentally came upstairs at this moment. They were Ethan Sawyer and his friends, whom the restaurant manager was personally showing the way for. With some joy and surprise, Declan hurriedly greeted them and bowed. Hello, Mr. Sawyer. Isn't this a godsend opportunity for me to get close to Ethan Sawyer? Sawyer frowned. Whenever he was walking, he would often be approached by random strangers trying to get close to him. The restaurant manager at the side was about to step forward to pull Declan away, but all of a sudden, Sawyer saw a familiar figure through the open door of the private room. Mr. Sawyer, I. Declan wanted to say something, but. Get lost. Sawyer had no time for him now. He simply pushed past Declan and hurried into the private room. Chapter 64 Blind You Are Listening at Novel Full. Audio. Translator Atlas Studios Editor Atlas Studios Declan was caught off guard and began stumbling away, but he definitely didn't dare to get angry. As soon as he regained his balance, he saw a person standing behind Sawyer, and his eyes lit up. Mr. Davis. You're here too. Declan hurriedly greeted Flynn Davis. Shut up. Davis similarly pushed past him. Without even looking at Declan, he hurried into the private room. Sawyer rushed into the private room and looked at Lucas, who was sitting on a chair. He smiled and bowed. I never expected to run into you here today, Mr. Gray. It's such a coincidence. I happen to be treating some friends to a meal here today. Please grant me the honor of having a meal with you. Davis greeted too. Hello, Mr. Gray, he almost addressed Lucas as chairman, but he held it back because he recalled Lucas's instructions not to reveal his identity. Lucas looked at Sawyer and Davis and grinned mirthlessly. Mr. Sawyer, you booked the entire restaurant for yourself just for a meal. I don't dare to stay. Sawyer was puzzled. Booked the entire restaurant. Who said that? The manager at the side immediately shuddered, thinking that his plan to cozy up to Ethan Sawyer by bootlicking had failed. The manager stood up and smiled. I was just scared that others might ruin your mood, but I didn't know that this gentleman here is your friend. I'm very sorry. The restaurant supervisor at the side also turned pale in shock. 
Actually, it was considered a common practice of their restaurant. Ethan Sawyer was the big boss of the restaurant, and since he was hosting some guests, the staff drove everyone away. However, he didn't know that one of the guests he had driven away was Ethan Sawyer's friend. This is horrible. The waiter who came over to clear the room was so scared that he started shuddering in fear and was on the brink of tears. He was just a waiter, and these things had nothing to do with him. Mr. Sawyer, I'm very sorry. The supervisor hurriedly bowed and apologized to Lucas. However, Sawyer directly interrupted him, enough. Since you've offended a distinguished guest, you're fired. Go collect your salary and leave. The manager and supervisor wanted to plead for leniency. But when they saw the stern expression on Sawyer's face, they were too scared to say anything and had no choice but to hang their heads low and go to the HR department to handle the procedures. Meanwhile, the waiter really felt like crying. Forget it. Lucas waved his hand. They just assumed that that was what you wanted. I wasn't offended either. With a look of embarrassment, Sawyer said smilingly, I will instruct them to pay more attention in the future and never repeat such a mistake again. After that, Sawyer glared at the three people in front of him, what are you still standing there for? Hurry up and thank Mr. Gray. If he hadn't spoken up for you, you would have lost your jobs. Remember, don't do such things again in the future. I'm not that demanding. Hearing Sawyer's words, the restaurant manager, the supervisor, and the unlucky waiter hurriedly bowed to Lucas and thanked him. Thank you for being so generous, Mr. Gray. Thank you so much. This scene made Declan Adams and Estelle Brook, who were standing at the entrance of the private room, stare wide-eyed at them. None of them expected that Ethan Sawyer, the richest man in Orange County, and Flynn Davis, the general manager of the Stardust Corporation, would actually swallow their pride in front of Lucas. They tried to fire the manager and supervisor because they thought that they had offended Lucas. However, the staff were saved by Lucas's words. How can he be an ordinary person? Declan felt that he was dreaming. In particular, a few minutes ago, he still treated Lucas as a loser who was just sponging off a woman. He even talked to him condescendingly. Thinking of this, Declan wanted to give himself a few slaps. Um. Mr. Gray, I'm so sorry for offending you just now. Please let me off on Charlotte's account and pardon me for my ignorance. Declan Adams bowed to Lucas carefully. Seeing her husband stooping so low, Estelle couldn't help but be furious. However, she also knew that someone who could make Ethan Sawyer and Flynn Davis stoop low too must be extraordinary and reckoned that she probably could not afford to provoke him. At the thought of this, Estelle glared at Charlotte with jealousy and resentment. What right does this woman whom my husband doesn't want have to find a boyfriend who's even more impressive than Declan? After hearing Declan's words, Lucas smiled. I'm just a jobless man waiting to sponge off a woman. How can I compare to you, Mr. Adams, who's so close to Mr. Davis of the Stardust Corporation? As soon as Declan heard this, he broke out in a cold sweat. Earlier, he had blindly bragged in front of Charlotte and Lucas, saying that he had a good relationship with Davis and would help Charlotte talk to him so as to help her get promoted. However, the truth was that Davis didn't know him at all. The worst thing was that Davis was right here. Wouldn't his lie be exposed then? As he had expected, Davis looked at Declan in bewilderment and asked with a frown, Who are you? These three simple words were like a loud slap on Declan's face. Declan's face began to heat up, and he hurriedly said, Mr. Davis, I'm from the Sunshine Corporation, and I'm here in Orange County to discuss the cooperation with your company. Davis had long heard what happened. He also understood that Declan must have offended Lucas and even deliberately bragged about being close to him. Someone like him wants to cooperate with the Stardust Corporation. He can forget about it. Davis interrupted Declan, the Stardust Corporation will not cooperate with you. From now on, we will reject all business dealings with you. Please leave. Declan immediately stiffened. But at this moment, Sawyer added, the same goes for the Sawyer Corporation. 
From now on, we will refuse any cooperation related to the Sunshine Corporation. The two big shots spoke at the same time and turned down all cooperations with the Sunshine Corporation, making Declan frightened speechless. This time, he came to Orange County on his family's orders to sign a cooperation agreement with the Stardust Corporation to expand the business scope of the Sunshine Corporation to Orange County. When his family finally handed the task to him, he was full of confidence, thinking that he would definitely be able to clinch the deal with his good looks and even expand into Orange County. However, before he did anything, he was condemned and declined by Flynn Davis, the general manager of the Stardust Corporation, and Ethan Sawyer, the richest man in Orange County, all because of this incident. Chapter 65 Proposing on the street you are listening at NovelFull.audio Translator Atlas Studios Editor Atlas Studios Declan's face was pale. He had completely foiled the matter regarding the cooperation. How could he face the people in the company when he returned? Hearing this, Estelle panicked too. You guys can't be such bullies. Mr. Davis, you clearly promised to cooperate with our company prior to this, which is the reason we rushed all the way here. How can you go back on your words? Davis frowned impatiently. When did I promise to cooperate with you? Estelle said indignantly, when my father called your company a few days ago, you clearly promised to consider cooperating with us. When Davis heard that, he was irked yet amused. He didn't remember promising to cooperate with the Sunshine Corporation, but it turned out that they had taken to his excuse, which was just a common response given to all companies. Thinking of this, Davis lost interest in arguing with the ignorant Estelle. He simply beckoned the waiter to bring them out. Feeling indignant, Estelle wanted to say something, but Declan hurriedly stopped her and dragged her out of Lion Restaurant. Why are you stopping me? I haven't suffered this kind of mistreatment since I was a child. Estelle slammed her Hermes bag against the floor and threw a tantrum. Ah, I'm doing this for your own good. If you keep prodding and end up pissing off Flynn Davis, the Sunshine Group will be in huge trouble too. Your father might be implicated as well, Declan said as he picked up Estelle's handbag and patted the dust off of it for her. He's not as impressive as you make out to be. He's just the general manager of a company in Orange County. What's the big deal? Estelle was agitated. Hey, pipe down. Declan hurriedly pulled Estelle to the side, fearing that others might hear what she said. After looking around and realizing that there was no one around, he whispered into Estelle's ears, if it's just Flynn Davis alone, it's not a big deal. But the Stardust Corporation is not simple at all. It's backed by the Huttons, one of the eight wealthiest families of the capital. You should have heard of how powerful and rich they are. Estelle had obviously heard of the Hutton family, who were well dot known in the country. She finally knew what the consequences of offending Davis were, and she couldn't help but be a little terrified. However, Davis was not in the mood to hold it against a small fry like her now. Davis and Sawyer were standing in front of Lucas with respectful smiles and trying to persuade him to have a meal with them. However, Lucas shook his head and declined. No thanks. I'm having a meal with my friend here. You guys go ahead. Since Lucas refused, Davis and Sawyer naturally couldn't stay behind any longer. Instead, they ordered the restaurant staff to prepare all the signature dishes as quickly as possible and send them to the private room where Lucas and Charlotte were. Soon, various colorful delicacies that smelled heavenly were delivered to Lucas and Charlotte. Charlotte looked at the sumptuous spread on the table, but she didn't move her fork and knife. After seeing that scene just now, she had a ton of questions for Lucas, but she didn't know where to start. Didn't you say you want to treat me to a meal? The dishes have been served. If you're not going to dig in, I will. Lucas didn't care what was on Charlotte's mind and instead just started eating casually by himself. Charlotte picked up her utensils and began eating, but the thoughts in her mind made the food seem bland and tasteless. Charlotte began to think about the details of events that occurred after Lucas's return. 
She thought of the large chest of expensive betrothal gifts that the Sawyers had delivered to her home and the fact that Ethan Sawyer said later on that they were thanked at you gifts for Lucas. Just now, Ethan Sawyer and Flynn Davis were obviously polite and subservient to Lucas, as though. Lucas was their superior. But was that possible? Another incident was when they were at the kindergarten, and Lucas and Jordan displayed their terrifying combat skills. They even looked like they had killed and witnessed bloodshed before, as they could break limbs and fight without hesitating. The day before yesterday, Lucas also saved her at the Lux, and when they finally left, the security officers in the club looked at Lucas with horror and fear in their eyes. What kind of a person is Lucas? What exactly did he do during the years he was missing? Charlotte was so absorbed in her own thoughts that she didn't notice that she had been staring at Lucas for a long time. After having his fill, Lucas wiped his mouth with a napkin. Then he realized that Charlotte was still staring at him blankly with her fork in her hand. With raised brows, he knocked on the table. Why do you keep staring at me? Do I have food on my face? Only then did Charlotte suddenly snap back to her senses. Her face turned red, and she hurriedly lowered her head to polish off the food on her plate. Unfortunately, she didn't even put any food on the plate and was just pretending to eat to hide her embarrassment. There are so many dishes in front of you. Do you prefer eating air? Lucas asked in bewilderment. It's none of your business. Charlotte hollered, angry because of her embarrassment. After that, Charlotte suddenly felt that she and Lucas were finally back to the way they were before, and she felt a sudden sense of relief. Forget it. No matter who he is, it's enough as long as he treats Cheyenne and our family well. In the afternoon, Lucas drove to the Brilliance Corporation to pick up Cheyenne from work. Although Cheyenne was very familiar with the Brilliance Corporation, and there was no need for her to be ferried to and fro, Lucas still wanted to do his best to fulfill his responsibilities as a husband. After waiting outside the Brilliance Corporation for a while, Lucas saw Cheyenne coming out with a crowd and was about to walk up to her. All of a sudden, a man dressed fancily rushed forward and knelt on one knee in front of Cheyenne. Seth Miller Cheyenne was stunned beyond words. Seth raised the diamond ring nestled in a box in his hand and gazed at her affectionately. Cheyenne, I genuinely adore you. So much has happened at home lately, but I still can't forget you. I think about you all day, and I even dream of you at night. Every day has been so bittersweet for me. So, I've decided to propose to you. Cheyenne, marry me. I will definitely bring you happiness. Many staff of the Brilliance Corporation and passersby surrounded them upon the site of the street proposal. They started taking photos and cheering loudly, say yes. Marry him. Cheyenne was so furious that her face turned red, and she snapped, Seth Miller, what are you trying to do? I've already told you I'm married. I have a husband and a daughter. I won't marry you. Ha. Huh. He's proposing to a married woman on the street. Noel did and that's exciting. More and more people started crowding around them, and many of them even began imagining countless versions of horrible storylines. Chapter 66 Overbearing Bully You Are Listening at Novel Full. Audio. Translator Atlas Studios Editor Atlas Studios Overwhelmed with Exasperation, Cheyenne clenched her fists so tightly that her knuckles turned white. She wanted to walk away directly, but she couldn't do so at all because of the gossipy crowd surrounding them. I know, but your husband is a thorough wastrel. After going missing for so many years, he's still a good. For. Nothing who's worlds apart from me. I'm different. I'll definitely treat you well. I can give you what he can't. That person isn't worthy of you at all. I'm thousands of times better than him. Seth exclaimed loudly, wishing he could undermine Lucas as much as possible. Enough. I don't want to hear you talk anymore. Do you know him? What right do you have to say anything about him? Cheyenne retorted coldly, full of disdain towards Seth for thinking that he was thousands of times better than Lucas. 
Seth couldn't hold a candle to Lucas, but even if he was really better than Lucas, it had nothing to do with her. At this moment, Cheyenne's eyes widened in surprise because Lucas was squeezing through the crowd and walking toward her step by step. Why are you here? Cheyenne looked at him in surprise. Lucas Gray. Seth glared at the uninvited guest hostily, completely forgetting that Lucas was Cheyenne's rightful husband. I'm here to pick you up to go home. Lucas looked at Cheyenne and handed her a ring made out of grass. I saw this along the way, so I made you one. It was a small ring woven of thin strands of green grass with a small purple flower in the middle. The crowd craned their necks and looked over, after which they couldn't help but burst into laughter. Oh my god! Do people still weave rings out of grass these days? That's so lowly. If he can't afford a diamond ring, he should at least buy a gold ring or a platinum ring, right? A glass ring is worthless. No wonder this man said that he's thousands of times better than the other man. It really seems to be the case. It's such a huge difference. This man proposed with a diamond ring that's at least a few carats, while the other proposed with a grass ring. Oh my god. Any woman would know who to choose. But to everyone's surprise, Cheyenne reached out and grabbed the grass ring Lucas handed her and put it on her finger. I like it a lot. Thank you. She smiled at Lucas radiantly. What? That woman actually chose the grass ring. Are you serious? Is there really a woman in this world who would choose a grass ring over a diamond ring? I don't believe it. TSK, what a beautiful yet silly girl. Why didn't I meet her earlier? Ah, such a pity. That rascal got an advantage. All of a sudden, everyone looked at Cheyenne like they were looking at a fool before looking at Lucas in envy. This rascal is too lucky. Ignoring the bizarre gazes on him from the people standing around them, Lucas took Cheyenne's hand and walked away. Boiling with fury, Seth glared at the two of them from behind and watched them leave. Lucas Gray. You loser, I won't let you go. Seth barked while gritting his teeth. Lucas and Cheyenne got into the car and headed to the kindergarten to pick Amelia up. Upon seeing her parents picking her up together, Amelia grinned widely and sprinted toward them. Daddy. Mommy. Lucas walked forward, picked Amelia up, and held her in his arms. Cheyenne originally wanted to say that Amelia was already six years old and didn't need to be carried all the time, but when she saw how happy and excited Amelia was, she couldn't bring herself to say it. Amelia had been looking forward to having a father for a long time, and now that she finally got closer to him, Cheyenne decided to just let them be. The three of them got into the car and headed home. Throughout the journey, Amelia couldn't contain her excitement and chattered incessantly about the new things that happened at school today. Although they were just some childish things, both of them were happy to hear her talk about them. Lucas was smiling, but he suddenly noticed that Cheyenne did not look too well. She was frowning slightly and seemed to be out of sorts. She only returned to her senses when Amelia shook her heart. Lucas inwardly frowned and asked seemingly casually, did something happen at the office today? Huh. Cheyenne was in a trance again, and she finally realized that Lucas was asking her a question. Hanging her head low, she stroked Amelia's head and tried to seem relaxed. Nothing. Everything's going well. Seeing her reaction, Lucas was even more certain that something must have happened to her at the Brilliance Corporation. However, he didn't state it explicitly. Upon returning home after dinner, Cheyenne said hesitantly, I have to go out to do something. I'll be home late. Lucas was a little surprised because Cheyenne almost rarely went out at night. She didn't like shopping or socializing, and she would spend most of her free time at home with Amelia, apart from the occasional overtime. Where are you going? I'll give you a lift, Lucas offered. Cheyenne shook her head. No, it's all right. I'll get a cab. Stay home and accompany Amelia. Lucas gazed at her and nodded. After Cheyenne left, Lucas immediately called Davis. 
Find out what happened to Cheyenne at the Brilliance Corporation today and inform me right away. Davis shivered. Yes, Mr. Gray. Lucas had always been very concerned about matters involving Cheyenne. Davis dared not be negligent as he hurriedly instructed his subordinates to find out. As a result, when the details of the matter were reported to him twenty minutes later, Davis turned pale. Even Davis was irked and angry after reading it. What more Lucas, who cared a lot about Cheyenne? Davis carefully told Lucas what happened. And just as he expected, Lucas flew into a rage and almost crushed his phone into pieces. Um. Mr. Gray, I'll order them to handle it immediately and cancel that task for Miss Carter, all right. Davis asked carefully. That's not necessary. It's too late. Lucas hung up with a gloomy expression and hurriedly said something to Amelia before rushing off somewhere. Lucas's gaze was cold. After he made Davis acquire the Brilliance Corporation, he had merely fired all the Carters who were employees instead of conducting a purge. Yet someone was now bullying Cheyenne. The place Cheyenne was going tonight was a company named Heaven Media, a famous company helmed by Brad Douglas's father. The task Cheyenne received was to discuss cooperation with Heaven Media. If she failed to complete it, she would be kicked out of the Brilliance Corporation. Chapter 67 His last name is Douglas II You are listening at NovelFull.audio Translator Atlas Studios Editor Atlas Studios Cheyenne was just a low-dot-level employee who held little authority and did not have a say at the Brilliance Corporation now. So she couldn't decline the task at all. Heaven Media was supposedly a film and television media company, and the company had signed many small-dot-time artists. But in reality, it had failed to produce any decent films or television productions. The artists were more like escorts specialized in maintaining the social connections of Heaven Media. Therefore, the office building of Heaven Media had extremely tacky decor. It was currently nighttime and thus even livelier than usual in the office. The small dot time artists could be seen entertaining clients in every corner. Their behavior was frivolous and seductive, and the office seemed more like a nightclub. Cheyenne frowned from the moment she stepped into the Heaven Media building. But when she thought about the fact that she was here to discuss cooperating with Heaven Media, she had no choice but to look away and pretend not to see what was happening. She walked straight to the front desk and inquired, Hello, is Mr. Douglas available? I'm Cheyenne Carter from the Carter Corporation, and I'm here to discuss our cooperation with him. The woman at the front desk scanned Cheyenne from head to toe with obvious contempt in her eyes. Mr. Douglas is available. Come with me, the receptionist said, as if she was already used to such matters. She then led Cheyenne to a private room upstairs. As soon as the door was pushed open, the pink and purple walls and lights almost blinded Cheyenne. Cheyenne stood at the door of the private room without going in and looked at the receptionist in confusion. Um. I'm here to talk about business. Shouldn't we go to an office for the discussion? The decorations and the facilities inside the room made it look just like a sordid entertainment joint, giving her a bad feeling. Is Miss Carter here? Come in, said a domineering voice. The receptionist gestured for Cheyenne to enter. Mr. Douglas is waiting for you inside. Miss Carter, please. Cheyenne took a deep breath, bit the bullet, and entered the room in a dignified gait. There was a middle dot aged man of about fifty years old with a checkered shirt sitting on the couch. His hair was slightly sparse, and despite the smile on his face, he didn't seem very affable or approachable. He was Gordon Douglas, the chairman of Heaven Media and Brad Douglas's father. When he saw Cheyenne enter, a flash of amazement appeared in his eyes. Huh, Miss Carter, I've heard a lot about you. You're worthy of being the greatest beauty of Orange County. Gordon stood up and extended his hand toward Cheyenne. Cheyenne extended her arm politely and shook his hand. Hello, Mr. Douglas. She was about to let go, but she realized that Gordon was still holding her hand tightly. In fact, he even grazed his thumb against her hand. 
Indeed, you look even more beautiful up close in person. They all say that women look even more beautiful under the light. That's indeed true. Gordon chuckled with his eyes glued to Cheyenne's face. Cheyenne frowned, thinking that Gordon Douglas had already crossed the line. You're being too polite, Cheyenne said calmly while retracting her hand. If not for the cooperation, Cheyenne wouldn't even have bothered to talk to him. She would have long opened the door and left. Mr. Douglas, I'm here today mainly for the cooperation between the Brilliance Corporation and your company. As you know, the Brilliance Corporation and the Stardust Corporation reached a long-term strategic partnership a few days ago. Enterprises and companies of various sizes have extended their invitations to us to seek cooperation. I won't say much about the development prospects of the Brilliance Corporation. We hope to achieve win-win -win cooperation with the major companies. What do you think? Cheyenne said politely in a business-like manner. During the banquet two days ago, the Brilliance Corporation became a famous company in the county with whom everyone vied to cooperate. In fact, the cooperation invitations of the various companies were already enough. There was no need for her to specially go to Heaven Media to discuss. After all, there were many companies wanting to cooperate with the Brilliance Corporation, and if Heaven Media rejected them, it would be their own loss. Ha, huh, I know what you mean, Miss Carter. The Brilliance Corporation is now very famous. Gordon sat down on the couch again, leaned back against it, and pointed to the seat beside him. Have a seat too, Miss Carter. Cheyenne frowned inwardly and sat down on the other couch beside the coffee table. Gordon Douglas acted as if he didn't see it at all. He picked up two glasses of champagne from a tray nonchalantly and gave one to Cheyenne. Miss Carter, you came here personally to discuss cooperating. Of course, I have to discuss it with you on your account. You want to cooperate. No problem. We can sign the contract in a bit. Let's toast to our happy cooperation. Gordon said straightforwardly. Cheyenne was a bit surprised. She initially thought that the cooperation would definitely fail, but she didn't expect him to agree so quickly. Seeing the wine glass being handed to her, Cheyenne grabbed it and clinked her glass with Gordon's. Thank you, Mr. Douglas. Here's to our happy cooperation. Gordon laughed and finished the champagne in one gulp. I've downed my glass. Miss Carter, help yourself. Since Cheyenne couldn't turn him down, she could only drink it. Fortunately, it was not high in alcohol content. Gordon grinned. I heard that you're married, Miss Carter, and your husband is alive. In son. In. Law. Cheyenne frowned slightly, not knowing why he suddenly brought up this matter. Nevertheless, she nodded to express assent. I didn't expect you to have heard about my personal life. Gordon propped himself up with his hands on the couch. Of course. Your husband is very capable. Cheyenne was confused by his answer. Does he know Lucas? Cheyenne only just realized that Lucas was an extraordinary person during the banquet a few days ago. Based on what Gordon said, she wondered if he was friends with Lucas. Cheyenne asked, Mr. Douglas, are you friends with my husband? Hearing this, Gordon suddenly burst into laughter, as if he had heard a funny joke. Ha ha ha. Friend. Of course not. Miss Carter, do you still remember what happened at the Lux the day before yesterday? At the mention of the Lux, Cheyenne obviously remembered everything that happened that day. Charlotte was abducted by Bryce, brought to the club, and almost violated. Wait. The person who colluded with Bryce to abduct Charlotte was Brad Douglas. He's a Douglas 2. Dot dot. Chapter 68 Showing up at the door you are listening at novel full. Dot audio. Translator Atlas Studios Editor Atlas Studios Cheyenne was overwhelmed with shock for a long time before asking, Mr. Douglas, what is your relationship? With Brad Douglas. Gordon smiled. He's my incompetent son. Cheyenne suddenly clenched her fist. 
this chairman of Heaven Media in front of her was actually the father of Brad Douglas. Since Gordon asked about Lucas, he definitely knew who Lucas was. Gordon continued, it's because of your capable husband, Lucas, that my unfilial son has become the laughingstock of all of Orange County. Miss Carter, what do you think I should do in return? Gordon's wry and insincere smile made Cheyenne feel a chill run down her spine. If Cheyenne still didn't understand by now that he wasn't intending to discuss cooperating with her, she would be a huge fool. No, recalling the half cup of champagne she just drank, Cheyenne stood up abruptly, her expression drastically changed. However, as soon as she stood up, she felt dizzy and couldn't even stand straight. You. Cheyenne glowered at Gordon furiously. But before she could even finish saying anything, she blacked out and fell onto the couch. Humph, standing beside the couch, Gordon looked down at Cheyenne, who had already passed out because of the medicine, and a vicious and sinister expression appeared on his face. Lucas Gray, you've hurt my son and tarnished his reputation, so you'll have to pay the price. On the way, Lucas sped as fast as he could in his Jaguar, rapidly weaving through the traffic. It took him less than 20 minutes to reach the Heaven Media office building. It had been more than half an hour since Cheyenne had left. He couldn't reach Cheyenne on the phone, so he didn't know if she was safe currently. If anything really happened to Cheyenne, he would definitely make everyone in the Douglas family die with her. Lucas's gaze was cold, and he had a murderous aura as he kicked the door of the Heaven Media office building with all his might. Hey! Who are you? The pretty receptionist stood up in a flustered manner and retreated. However, Lucas was already standing right in front of her. Did a woman named Cheyenne come here earlier? Where is she now? Lucas's gaze was horrifying, and he looked like he wanted to devour someone. The receptionist was so frightened that she started shuddering in shock. However, she dared not speak up. Mr. Douglas specially brought that woman named Cheyenne to the private room. They're definitely still doing the deed now. I'm just a receptionist. How can I let someone go and stop them? Dot Lucas's patience was running thin, and he kicked the marble table at the side. The solid marble table immediately shattered into bits like tofu before collapsing in the middle. Speak. The pretty receptionist's body was shaking violently, and she was so frightened, her legs turned weak. She fell onto the ground, petrified with fear. He kicked the solid marble table and managed to make such a big hole in it. If he kicks me. At this moment, she could no longer care about how terrified she was of Gordon Douglas. The man in front of her was too terrifying. S. That she's upstairs. In the private room the receptionist said while shivering, suddenly finding the cold aura even more terrifying. Lucas left the front desk, leaving the horrified receptionist behind, and walked directly toward the stairs. Who dares to create trouble here in Heaven Media? A bunch of security officers rushed out to stop Lucas. Humph, tell Gordon Douglas to come out. Lucas didn't take those insignificant security officers seriously at all. How dare you call the chairman by his full name, the captain of the security officers hollered as the security officers surrounded Lucas. The manager of Heaven Media hurriedly ran upstairs and reported from outside the private room, Mr. Douglas, a young man has barged in and demands to see you and Miss Carter. He's very proficient in fighting, and I'm afraid our security officers won't be able to stop him. Oh. Gordon knew who had come as soon as he heard it, and a playful smile appeared on his face. Tell him to come up. I've prepared a big gift for him here. The manager hesitated slightly. But as he thought about the means that Gordon Douglas usually resorted to, he answered respectfully, yes, Mr. Douglas. The manager rushed downstairs and was ready to ask the security officers to stand down, only to realize to his horror that not a single security officer in the lobby could stand. The manager felt his blood turn cold. Facing Lucas's icy dot cold gaze, the manager felt like he was about to collapse onto the ground. M.M.R. Douglas W. that would like you to go up. Upstairs, the manager stammered, his teeth chattering due to his fear. 
At this moment, Lucas's aura was too terrifying. A single glance was scary enough to make him shiver. After shooting him a hostile glance, Lucas headed upstairs. Jordan appeared at the door behind him, holding a person's ankle like this man was a dead dog drenched in blood. He dragged him through the door and followed Lucas upstairs without saying a word. The manager pressed his body against the wall and only heaved a sigh of relief and sat down after the two walked past him. His heart pounded rapidly as he looked at the trail of blood left behind on the floor. After Lucas and Jordan went upstairs, many small dot time artists and rich clients, who had been hiding and watching, finally started whispering to each other. This is the business of the Douglases. Who dares to be so brazen as to create trouble here? Those two are just too young and have a death wish. Exactly. The Douglas family is powerful and has connections with all the gangs. Even we don't dare to mess with them. Those two youngsters probably won't even know how they died. As the discussion got heated downstairs, Lucas and Jordan had already arrived upstairs. The door of the private room opened. Gordon was sitting on the leather couch nonchalantly. Upon seeing the two of them, he narrowed his eyes and sized them up. Ha, just two young punks. How dare they beat my son so badly. Gordon snapped his fingers, and a muscular and burly man more than two meters tall waked over from the side and stood next to him. When the muscular man walked, the floor of the room trembled slightly. He was clearly trying to intimidate Lucas and Jordan. However, Lucas did not even bother glancing at the tall and muscular man in front of him. Instead, he stared at the couch beside Gordon. Cheyenne was lying on the couch. Fortunately, she was fully clothed, and there were no other traces on her body. The tension in Lucas's heart finally eased up. You should be glad that you didn't touch her. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to sit here and talk to me now. Lucas glared coldly at Gordon. Chapter 69 Smashed with a single punch you are listening at Novel Full. Audio. Translator Atlas Studios Editor Atlas Studios hearing this, Gordon smiled. Young man, you're very arrogant, huh? However, I didn't touch her precisely because I was waiting for you to come. I want you to see that scene with your own eyes. Watching your woman being violated and destroyed while you're unable to do anything must be wonderful, wouldn't it? The murderous intent in Lucas's eyes intensified. Initially, he wanted to be lenient with Gordon Douglas, but it now seemed unnecessary. Damn it. Old dog, what are you saying? Jordan flew into a rage and immediately wanted to charge forward to kill Gordon, but he was stopped by Lucas. I'm not as arrogant as you two. You abducted someone and drugged them. You guys seem to like this trick a lot. I wonder how your son felt when he got a taste of his own medicine. Do you want to have a try too? In any case, you've got a candidate here, so I might as well fulfill your wish. Lucas narrowed his eyes as he glanced at Gordon and the muscular man beside him. Kid, you're very gutsy. Gordon was stunned for a moment but soon started laughing again despite his anger. You're just alive that I end son dot in dot law of a lowly family. You're a useless loser. Where did you get the courage to speak to me like that? The Douglas family is well respected in the county. You're not afraid of dying, huh? The Douglas family is nothing. Lucas sneered disdainfully, not taking the Douglas family seriously at all. Also, you're wrong. You're the one who has a death wish. Who gave you the courage to touch my wife? You're on the brink of death, and you're still so sharp dot tongued, huh? I'll see if your bones are as tough as your mouth. Gordon sneered sinisterly and was about to beckon the muscular man beside him to make a move when. Jordan, what are you waiting for? Deliver the big gift we prepared for him, Lucas shouted. Yes, Lucas. Hearing his order, Jordan immediately flung the man he had been dragging along, and the bloodied body rolled toward Gordon. He was completely motionless, and it was unclear if he was alive or not. Gordon glanced at the pathetic figure. 
His limbs had been broken, and he was lying limply on the ground. His face was also battered with bruises, and his flesh was badly mangled with blood all over the place, so much so that he was unrecognizable. Gordon sneered and looked at Lucas and Jordan. Where did you get this man from? Are you trying to scare me? I've been mingling among gangs for decades. I'm not that easily intimidated. Jordan couldn't help but snicker and mock. Old dog, you'd better open your dog eyes and take a good look. Otherwise, it'll be the end of your family lineage. What do you mean? Gordon furrowed his brows. Don't you have eyes? Can't you see for yourself? There you go. Jordan pointed his chin at the hideous figure. Gordon lowered his head and pressed his foot against the bloodied figure on the ground. Then a familiar dot-looking gold pendant tumbled out. Startled, Gordon hurriedly took a closer look. Indeed, there was the word, Douglas, engraved on the pendant. It was the gold pendant his son had been wearing ever since he was a child. Looking at the bloodied figure in front of him, he began to find him more and more familiar. Looking, so familiar that his heart palpitated. Gordon stood up abruptly and roared furiously, Brad. Jordan grinned and said to Lucas, Lucas, I've beaten him to the point that his old man can't even recognize him. Lucas smiled. Good job. I'll reward you later. Gordon grimaced in rage. When he heard their words, he was so furious that he turned hysterical. Good, great. You two brats, I must kill you. I'll make sure you die without a complete corpse. Gordon hollered at the tall, muscular man beside him, go, beat them until they die. I'll give you one dot and dot a half million dollars. I want you to crush their bones and make them wail and repent. Yes. The burly and muscular man clenched his fist, and the sounds of his bones cracking immediately filled the air. He took a few steps forward, and the entire ground of the room quaked a few times. However, Lucas glanced at the muscular man calmly and said to Jordan, I'll leave it to you. Without looking at him anymore, he walked toward Cheyenne. After being ignored, the muscular man roared and raised his fist to punch Lucas hard on his head. If the punch really landed on his head, it would definitely be smashed into bits. Lucas remained calm, as if he didn't notice the punch coming at him. Humph, you've got a death wish. Wade is a king of underground boxing, and he can blow your head into pieces with a single punch. Let's see how you can keep being arrogant. Gordon's lips twisted into a smirk, as though he could already see Lucas's head getting smashed. At this moment, a figure flashed out, and a faster fist slammed against Wade's fist. With a loud bang, the muscular Wade was forced to retreat several steps. At the same time, Wade shrieked in pain. His right hand was hanging in front of his body at an extremely unnatural angle, and his right arm was quivering violently. His fingers and wrists were all broken. Gordon's eyes widened in disbelief. Wade was a combat expert he had hired at a high price. With his fists alone, he had already crushed the heads of countless people. Gordon Douglas paid this high price all for the sake of killing Lucas and taking revenge for his son. However, not only did Wade fail to hit Lucas with his punch, he had the bones of his fingers and wrists broken by Jordan's punch. How could Gordon stand it? In fact, he was already prepared to get Wade to beat Lucas Gray and then make him watch Cheyenne Carter get violated to appease the hatred in his heart. Dot now, all his plans were foiled. In contrast, Lucas ignored it. He simply walked to Cheyenne, picked her up in his arms, and then turned around to leave. He didn't want Cheyenne to stay in such a dirty place any longer. Hold it. Seeing that Lucas was about to take Cheyenne away, Gordon obviously wasn't willing to take it lying down. If you guys dare to step out of here, I will kill you immediately. Do you believe it? Gordon grimaced. All he heard was Lucas's derisive sneer. Humph. Chapter 70 I don't want to die you are listening at Novel Full. Audio. Translator. Atlas Studios Editor.
Atlas Studios, oomph, what are you being arrogant about? You're just alive that I son dot in dot law. So what if you have an impressive brother? Do you dare to touch me? Moreover, if the Douglases want to kill you, it'll be a piece of cake. Gordon hollered. Jordan rushed forward and slapped Gordon on his lips. How dare you be so arrogant in front of Lucas? I'm going to hit you. How dare he threaten Lucas? He must have a death wish. Gordon was dumbfounded by Jordan's sudden slap. In the decades of his life, he had never been hit on the face before, especially not by a good nothing sidekick. Gordon was so furious that he wished he could kill the two of them immediately. Unfortunately, the expert he hired had his hand crippled. How dare you beat up the future successor of the Douglas family? There's no need for your family to exist anymore. He thought that Lucas would be scrupulous and fearful, but Lucas simply laughed nonchalantly after hearing his words. Do as you please. But you're just throwing your weight around because of your family's prestige. Do you think the Douglas family is a big deal? If your family is destroyed, do you think you'd still have the right to be so arrogant to me? Huh, you want to destroy the Douglas family? You can dream on. Even the richest man in the county wouldn't dare to say that he could destroy my family, let alone a loser like you. Gordon looked at Lucas like he was a fool. Lucas smiled, not wanting to speak anymore. The Douglas family was insignificant to him. It was a piece of cake for him to destroy the Douglas family. Carrying Cheyenne in his arms, Lucas was about to leave when Gordon suddenly pulled out a Bergman Bayard automatic pistol and pointed the muzzle at him. Like I said, if you dare to leave this place, I will kill you immediately. Put her down. Or else don't blame me for pulling the trigger. Gordon shouted, appearing rather hysterical. His plan for today was to avenge his son by making Lucas watch Cheyenne get violated. Before reaching his goal, he would not let them leave. Besides, Jordan had just slapped him. How could he, Gordon Douglas, stand such an insult? Now that he had his pistol in hand, he no longer feared anything. Even if Lucas and Jordan were impressive fighters, they wouldn't be faster than a bullet. Lucas was really annoyed at this moment. Since Cheyenne was safe and sound, he originally planned to let Gordon Douglas off with a light punishment. However, he didn't expect him to be so ignorant. Since he has a death wish, I won't be merciful to him. Lucas glanced at the Bergman Bayard automatic pistol that Gordon was holding, but he wasn't phased by it at all. Do you think you can shoot me with that tiny pistol? Lucas's disdainful attitude irritated Gordon even more. Gordon held up the pistol and said in annoyance, what are you pretending for? I don't believe you can dodge a bullet. If you put that woman down and kneel in front of me, I will consider giving you a way out. Otherwise, this pistol will shoot all three of you dead. I've been involved with gangs for a long time, so it's not like I haven't killed anyone before. It was clear that Gordon was threatening him. Lucas remained unfazed. If you have what it takes, you can try shooting me. If you can't kill me, all the members of the Douglas family will die with you. Lucas's tone was brimming with cold killing intent, and the temperature around him abruptly plummeted. Lucas could not tolerate the fact that Gordon repeatedly tried to violate Cheyenne in front of him. Great. I gave you a chance. You're the one who wants to die. Gordon gritted his teeth with a menacing expression. He raised the pistol and was about to pull the trigger to shoot Lucas. Wait. Don't shoot. Wade, the muscular man at the side, suddenly interrupted. He glanced at Lucas with scruples and tried to stop Gordon. What? Do you want to betray me? Don't forget. I paid you to be here, even though you were totally useless. Gordon barked while glaring at Wade with reddened eyes. Now, he just wanted to kill Lucas, and whoever stopped him would be his enemy. No, you can't kill him at all. Do you think a gun is invincible? You won't even hit him. And once you shoot, he won't let you off. He won't let me off either. 
I don't want to die here. Wade exclaimed with a frown. Humph, I don't believe it. You're a useless good dot four dot nothing, and he's just pretending to be powerful, yet you're so scared. You're such a coward. Get lost. I must kill him. Gordon roared furiously. Wade shook his head regretfully. Since you insist on ignoring my advice, don't blame me then. Before Wade finished speaking, he suddenly dashed at Gordon and strangled him from behind with his uninjured left hand. W. What are you doing? Gordon panicked. He never expected Wade to bite the hand that fed him. At the same time, both Lucas and Jordan were also a little surprised. Like I said, I just want to live. If you had shot, they definitely wouldn't have let me go. If you refuse to take my advice, I'll have to kill you first. Wade tightened his grip on Gordon's neck, causing the latter to choke and his eyes to roll backward. Dot the fear of death instantly surged in Gordon's heart. At this moment, he no longer cared about taking revenge or restoring his pride. He just wanted to survive. Stop. I, I will listen. To you. Gordon struggled to say a few words in a muffled voice. Wade felt a tingling sensation on his wrist and subconsciously let go of Gordon. He looked over in horror, only to see Lucas staring at them with a straight face and Jordan fiddling with the Bergman pistol. Jordan had grabbed the pistol in Gordon's hand just now in an instant. Even Wade didn't see how he actually moved. Wade had no idea what struck his wrist either. In short, he didn't get a clear glimpse despite having sharp vision. This could only mean that Jordan's combat skills were far superior to his. If they really wanted to kill him, he'd never be able to escape. After Gordon escaped from a close shave with death, his legs and feet went limp, and he collapsed onto the ground while covering his neck and panting heavily. The threat of death had overwhelmed him with fear.